Did you guys see the news? Jat is the new head coach for Team Liquid. Big news for Team Liquid fans, or just big news in general. Someone who's very well respected in the League of Legends community is Jat, and now he's a head coach. Jat's never been the guy that wanted to be in the spotlight. He doesn't get complacent. He's always thinking about what he can do next and how he can do it better. He had such a wealth of knowledge and experience that had developed over time in his career. Does he want to win? He wants to win really bad. I think he's going to win Worlds. There was always that difference of like gaming being kind of nerdy and sports being this cool thing. I always really dreamed that both could be cool. I was born in a town called Penn Valley in California in the U.S., but I grew up pretty much my entire childhood in Cranbrook, British Columbia, which is in Canada. We had an inner tube thing where we'd knock each other off and laugh and laugh and laugh. We'd take the little dinghy and we'd row around the lake. We had so much fun. Josh's my second child. My first child was Callie. Josh's older sister by three years, and she's a master's level clinician working with a very at-risk group. They're both a joy. Nothing better I like than bragging about my kids. Not, not that I had anything to do with it, but <laughs> we with their successes, but I am proud of that. Before I was born, my mom was actually an archeologist, but then after I was born and when she was a mother, she was a social worker for the government for many, many years. My dad has done a pretty wide variety of jobs throughout most of my life. He was a counselor for alcohol and drug addiction. I think we have both contributed to our kids being good at communication because it was very important in his job and my job. We were very careful about how we communicate. I believe we did a great job with them because we treated them with respect and looking at ourselves and cleaning up our own messes. And I think that Josh has done that. Josh is really his own person. He's so eclectic. He just have all this music, like from way back when I was a kid. And we're older parents. I go into his room and he had two monitors and he'd have some movie or some documentary on one screen and he'd have League on the other screen and he'd be working a Rubik's Cube. Rubik's Cube, yo-yos. He got really, really good at yo-yo. He also picked up juggling. He got really quite good at juggling. Just whatever, whatever he took an interest in, he was good at it. I was really, really into sports. Hitting a ball to the end of the yard, picking it up, running back, hitting it again, or just shooting free throw after free throw. Basketball, baseball, football. He was really good at golf. He had to take swimming lessons. Aha, uh -huh, that's one thing I made him do. I was really into basketball, probably around sixth or seventh grade. That's when I was on like our middle school team. He was really good at free shooting. We practiced for hours and hours and hours on our basketball hoop in the yard. I could not beat this guy. And I, I, I had a pretty good eye too, but he would just bury me and I'd get so pissed off. At that age, past the NBA three-point line, drilling baskets. And then football, he's, he's got a hell of an arm. He could throw the ball about 65 yards, you know, back then. Football, that was something that I had been interested in pretty much my whole life. I would watch football with my dad, and during commercials, I would line up in the kitchen, and we had this little not real football, it was a, like squishy football. And I would just run from the kitchen into the living room. My dad would throw it at some point and I'd try and make some like diving catch. Whenever we damaged anything in the house because of what we were doing, we covered it up with glue and <laughs> so mom wouldn't find out. Played a couple years at the, you know, kind of high school and youth football level. It went a little bit beyond high school in Canada for me. So I played for four years and really, really enjoyed that. He went out, he, he tried out for the, for, for the team. He came back and he was a little bit downcast and he said, well, I'm, 
I'm the backup. Well, the very, very first game, this guy comes off the end and just levels our starting quarterback, and Joshua is tossed into this game. He goes into the huddle and quarterbacked uh, this team on, on the field, and I heard him just yell, get your shit together. So he'd already taken over leadership of the team and the game, and the people followed him. He just, he was confident. Josh has the ability to focus. When the team would lose, he would be quiet. And what I came to realize, what he was figuring out how they lost and what they needed to do to win. And he would just be doing that and always thinking in 3D. He would say, this happened, this happened, and this happened. And he'd be, he'd be off in some 3D thought. I've definitely been pretty analytical and logical in the way that I look at sports or, or try and play sports. You know, when I was a kid, before necessarily there was a really good ESPN or NBA website, uh, I would just look up box scores in the newspaper and then <laughs> pretty much every day I would like come into school and tell my friends of like, oh yeah, by the way, Shaq had 25 points, 12 rebounds, three blocks, four assists last night. The Lakers won, you know, 102 to 96 against the Nets. And I just like recite this information and know all the stats about all of my favorite players. That continued a little bit into other sports of just always trying to find a way that I could get a little bit better not even consciously like saying I'm gonna set this like really structured plan, but just doing it. I'd put a chair up in the backyard and I'd be 20 yards away from it and I'd take a football and I'd just drill that chair over and over. Like I'd throw it, I'd hit the chair, I'd go pick it up, I'd throw it, I'd hit the chair again and I'd pick a spot on the chair and I'd try and hit that spot on the chair. And I would just do that for hours until we broke the chair. Just stuff like that of trying something, seeing that it was a little bit off, making a small adjustment, trying again, and then also just paying a huge amount of attention to the numbers of other sports when I could. Does he want to win? He wants to win really bad, really bad. But if he loses, he figures out why they didn't win and comes back with something different, something better. And I, I totally respect him for that. He spent a lot, a lot of time playing games, a lot. The first computer game that I remember playing was this game called Icebreakers. You're this little kind of triangle trying to break ice while little blobs chase you. And there was this really early on MMO called The Realm Online. And I played that game for probably like three or four years I spent on that game, just kind of leveling up characters. I had two different accounts with basically max leveled characters. And I actually sold one of the accounts for $625. And I was able to buy a PlayStation 2 with it. He and I set up a PayPal account. And this young woman in Texas sent all this money to, to his bank account. And he turned around and bought another console. I don't know what it was, a PS something. He bought it himself. This is life with Joshua. Around 2004 was the year that I got the most into Madden. It was also a year that I was playing football and just watching a ton of football. So I was really kind of entrenched in that, in that life. I knew all the players, all the rosters, and I played a lot of Madden online. We did a road trip for our football team and our coach thought he was really good in Madden. So he was just trash talking us on the bus on the way over that he could beat any of us in Madden. And I just like pretty calmly said like, yeah, we should play, like I'm pretty good. And I didn't say anything else. Like I was definitely not trying to show bravado or anything. <laughs> I think when we played, uh, I was up 35 nothing in the first quarter and he rage quit, <laughs> which was uh, pretty enjoyable for me. The, the gaming stuff, he just dominated. And he dominated with confidence. He didn't show off. He just, he just left you in the dust. For a lot of my sporting life growing up, I kind of hid how good I was at games or how interested I was at games. That's, that wasn't something that I bragged about or could outwardly be proud of with the other like athletes on the football team because to them, like it only matters how good you are at real sports or football and even the term like real sports. I always really dreamed that 
Both could be cool. Guild Wars was just a game that I originally played with some friends from high school. That was really the game where I kind of fell in love with online gaming and even just like the beginning of esports, I think. Okay, that was a little scary. Everyone, I wouldn't have done that if we weren't coming to Everyone chase him, it'll get the monks out. The team that I was most successful on was this team called Rebel Rising. Every month there was what's called like a monthly championship where just all the top guilds go into this like Swiss style bracket, which then goes into a single elimination. It's played out in like a day. We won 12 of 24 and no other team won more than two. So we were much better than the other top teams in the game at the time. And a lot of that was through the like trust we had in each other, which I think were really formative for me in like a competitive gaming aspect. Growing up, he was in the bedroom a lot playing either Guild Wars or I think later in the week, and I never really knew the intensity of what he was doing, of what he was playing. He would come out of the bedroom on a Saturday morning, and he was just quiet. And he paced, and he might eat something, and then he'd go back in for the game too. I realize now that I've been watching him, he was just intense. Like, there was no getting through whatever his thought pattern was. The game, I think, really leveled up my like in-game communication skills. And I think when that game was dying down, I kind of came over to League with that group of players. The other main like frontline player was this guy called Chop Chop the Panda. But in League of Legends, people knew him as Guardsman Bob. And he was actually the one who probably really pushed me into League in the first place. I think because I moved with this group of people that I was already really comfortable gaming with, not only did it make it more fun, but it also made it so we could improve at a really rapid rate because we trusted each other. Our teamwork was really good. So to me, that's what gave me like a small leg up on a lot of other people moving into League. For the most part, the, the group I was playing with was casually competitive. We made this really meme team. The name is stupid. It was like Disciples of the Great Whale Lord King, and then the tag was Whale. For the most part, we would just try and play really experimental or really cheesy things because we loved theory crafting. The only tournaments in NA at the time were these like little gopher lol things, and it just took the whole day. And if you won, you got $20. We actually beat TSM in two consecutive gopher lols, <laughs> running our like kind of joking stuff. This was before NA even had like 80 carry support as a defined meta. This predates that. So through that, I had more interest in the game. I could be a pretty strong shot caller. I felt like I understood the game pretty well. And when some of those other friends I was playing with kind of petered out in the game and didn't play it as much and didn't really want to take it seriously, I saw that in the season one world championship qualifier, this team called Rock Solid finished fourth, which was one spot shy of going to the world championship. And then when I watched the World Championship, I saw how many people watched, and I thought like, man, this thing could actually be real. Like this is, this is what I've always wanted Guild Wars to do, and League is actually doing it. Like I need to, I need to try and dive in here. And I got a friendship with uh, their support player at the time called Locust, and I mentioned like, hey, anytime you guys need another one for a practice, like let me know, I'd love to play. This team had Skara and Voiboy, who were both top 10 on the ladder, and if you had good laners, jungling was easy then you just need someone who can run the map. Call objectives, call where I'm gonna be able to go, communicate where the other jungler is. No one was doing that in League because it was a solo duo game. So almost all of these guys had never been in the team environment, had never been used to talking while playing, which I had been doing nonstop for years. That was our advantage at the time and that's kind of how I found my way into competitive League. World Cyber Games back then, certainly around the 2010, 2011, was probably the tail end of the World Cyber Games, I would say. This was like when they, it was massive. There was mega money behind it, full TV productions, Korean TV trucks, the lot, everything coming in. It was, the, I would say, probably the pinnacle esports tournament at the time. Let's transition over to WCG stuff. Um, oh boy. I know, right? This has kind of turned into a huge deal. We haven't really heard much from anybody on, on your team, Jet, so maybe you can say whatever you want to from the, the Dignitas perspective. 
before I had joined Dignitas, I had kind of loosely agreed to participate in this Canadian team qualifier for WCG. And I believe we finished second or third because we lost to the COG team. I was a dual citizen. I still am a dual citizen. I was born in the US, but I grew up in Canada and I have dual citizenship. And then we played in this US qualifier. We were up against Chicks Dig Elo. And in the lobby, they're like, by the way, Jad is not allowed to play. We've checked the rules and you're not allowed to play for two different countries. I talked to the admin that I knew and he's like, oh yeah, that rule only applies to the actual event. So like once you're at WCG, you can't be for US and Canada, but like you can try for both. And I'm like, all right, cool. And we just told him like, nope, I'm allowed to play. And we just like played. Everyone thought I was cheating and that Dignitas was cheating and that I wasn't allowed to be there. In the upper bracket, we beat them. So that's when people started to get pretty pissed because this illegal team beat this really popular team and there was only one spot for a US team to go to WCG. The way you do the finals is the winner's bracket has a one game advantage in the best of three. So we just had to win one game and we were through in our heads. And they 2 owe us. And we're like, we're so down, we're so upset. <laughs> and then the next day, a WCG admin tells us that we played it wrong. That we didn't have a game advantage, we had a set advantage. And that we need to play again. So we play it and we beat them. <laughs> and now we're the team that's gonna go to WCG. After we won, there was a thread that said, petition to ban Scumbag Jat from League of Legends forever and got like 600 comments in like a minute. The official League of Legends forums crashed. Over the past week or so, I've been extremely disappointed with the way the community reacted to this. And I don't think that we need to turn everything into personal attacks against everyone. The Scumbag Jat comments are really disappointing to see. The one thing I just kind of want to stress is I don't like how so much of the blame has fallen on Boy Boy and Dignitas in general because it's a WCG issue. Really sorry about the way everything went down and the way the rules were interpreted by the public and by Reginald and the way they were made so public. But I was just following the rules. I was just listening to the admins. That's all. Did it bother him? Um, no, I don't think it did. Like, I think he heard it. The posts, you know, online, and I'm not saying that it would just water off a duck's back, but um, he just moved on. I was amazed at his strength of character in dealing with that. It would have torn, torn me up a lot more than I believe it tore him up. Riot ended up modifying the tournament to have 17 teams, and two teams from the U.S. could go to WCG in Korea. We did give it the okay. We're just like, yeah, it's the right thing to do. Like, send both teams. They deserve it. Their team beat us 2-1 in the quarterfinals and then didn't drop another game the rest of the tournament to win 25 grand. Our jungler got caught and our top didn't do well. It was just really bad, really bad teamwork and his stuff just went overboard. We were just kind of hanging out because our return flights weren't for a couple days and the tournament was going to continue to play out and we had nothing to do. So one day, in the hotel lobby, D-Man, who is casting the League of Legends with Joe Miller, is like, does anybody want to cast the third place match for League of Legends? Because Joe Miller is casting another game and I'd like a co-caster. I think the Counter-Strike Grand Final was on at the same time. So Joe and Red Eye were at the main stage having to cast that. In my head, I thought, right, okay, I've spoken to Skara a bunch. Let's go get Skara and we'll commentate. And I was sat chatting with the team, Dignitas guys were all there. And, and I was also chatting with Jan. I was like, you know, he's actually, he's pretty well spoken. He's, he, he can get his points across really well. So I was just like, yeah, you you guys want to come and uh, come and, uh, come and cast this semi-final? Like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I had been a huge sports fan. I really liked talking about the game and I thought it would be fun. Uh, I sat down, um, Jat sat there, and Skara was sat behind us, so we were just like, pick and bands would kick off, and we'd be passing it between us each, like passing the mic back to Skara and Jat. That's where it really all began, that I would obviously do the play-by-play, -play, and because Jat was sat next to me, I would just pass it straight to Jat, and then Jat would be like, passing it to Skara, and Skara was like, no, nah, no, nah. he was just sat back, enjoying it. 
<laughs> so he was just sat behind us watching. So it ended up being mostly me and Jack that actually cast the game. And that's kind of like where it all kicked off from there, really. And CLG will close out the first game. So well played by them. And really, Jay, you called this one all the way through and basically said, you know, they're going to do well at the start, but Canada are going to come back. And, and it's exactly what happened. They just came back very strong. League of Legends casting was very, very green. It had very few, if none at all, pro players to actually do the color play-by-play, -play, like dynamic, that most people in esports didn't even know existed, or at least in League of Legends esports didn't know existed. For me, like I just knew that's how casting was because I'd watched pro sports and I knew all the top commentators were always a color commentator who was a former pro player. So I like, I kind of knew what the archetype was. Jack was really good at being concise and to the point and answering like exactly what you asked him. And obviously at the time he was a, a, a pro player as well. So it's like you got, you're getting the full top tier knowledge of like the inside scene. So it was perfect really. I cast with D-Man a lot throughout my casting career, uh, but especially so at the start. After I started the Riot, we did a bunch of the season two circuit events, which is how they qualified teams for Worlds before they had the LCS. And we actually cast the season two World Finals together, which was pretty cool. They proved not only in their team fighting, not only with their coordination, but individually, they're the best players and the best team in the world. This is D-Man and Jap signing off for the day, but I mean, you guys, it's been such an such honor. An honor. Even though I was really loving playing high-level League of Legends, towards the very end of 2011, beginning of 2012, I tried to get in at Riot to join the company, and my goal was like, I really wanted to help balance the game. I ended up joining as a QA analyst on the live design team in 2012, in large part because it was something that I'd always been really interested in, and it was actually a career which at the time was really uncertain in esports. So all the time that I was casting the circuit events or even the season two world championship, I was still QA analyst on the live design team. When Riot planned and pitched the LCS, they wanted to get full-time casters. And at the time I was actually pretty hesitant because I really had kind of a dream of becoming a game designer and really balancing the game. And I was really enjoying that job, but the opportunity to be one of, if not like the voices analytically of League of Legends on the LCS broadcast or at international events for English language was just like, it was too much to pass up. It was maybe even like, weirdly, like a bigger dream for esports to be considered legit. When I went to Korea, I saw that for the first time. The staff at the restaurant was like impressed that we were pro gamers. Even the fact that they knew that would just like blew my mind that that was a thing. The fact that we were trying to do that with League in North America was really, really, really exciting to me. I felt like I was uniquely qualified to enhance that experience. Originally, my plan was like, I'm just gonna do this thing for like a couple years, and then I'm sure we're gonna have like a bunch of other people that can do it well, and then I'll go back to game design. Like that was actually my thought in my head of like, I just, I just need to, to make this happen. Double if sitting on high mana, just resetting everyone's health. It's gotta feel good for Rookie and the rest of IG. 6-1-7 I've never seen a professional game this close. End of 2013, I was hired at Riot to come and produce the LCS broadcast. I think early on, Jat recognized that maybe I had some good knowledge about story and about sports story. And I think he, you know, had the League of Legends knowledge and the, and the LOL Esports knowledge. And I think he really almost took me under his wing and wanted to invest in me and make sure that I knew what was going on with the game because he thought that, you know, I could help him in developing story and doing storylines on the show. And so we, we developed a pretty good bond um, just because of our love of sports. You get that camaraderie when you're on a team and and you're you know, telling stories about the LCS. When, when something isn't right, he's not just like, all right, well, the show's over and uh, I don't have to worry about it now. He wants to sit around and he wants to get into it about what went wrong, why it went wrong, how we can make it better. And he's always been um, a problem solver. He loves solving problems, finding a better way to do something, finding a better way to, to get something done. And I think in that there's leadership because 
People want to win and people want to follow those who they think are going to help them win. And I think like those characteristics of his very much, you know, made him a leader on the team. I was a full-time caster six straight years doing LCS and international events and doing content and doing podcasts and doing lists and like all the stuff that I'd experienced from ESPN or other sports. And I just did my best to port that all over to league and just make the experience feel real and feel cool. And Cloud9 will shut down Team Liquid's playoff chances and slam them into the ground. After the disappointing performance in the spring, we decided that we wanted to take a look at why that happened. We saw problems with our band pick, our preparation going into games, lack of charisma and leadership in the training process. These were all some of the things that we saw on the coaching side and we know we needed to make some changes. Thinking about being a coach for a league team has been on my mind for a really long time. Because when I was a player, I'd go through our team's rune pages and optimize them. And I'd go through their mastery pages and tell them what was, was best at the time. But then I wasn't gonna do it until I felt like orgs were in a good professional place where it could be a stable, good job and so much other stuff in my life to make sense. When I first had reached out to Jet and asked him if he was interested in head coaching with the team a couple years ago. He said, you know, I, I don't know what I want to do right now. I think I might go from casting and do this other thing within Riot, I'm kind of trying to find my identity, you know, and I, I don't know if head coaching is it for me. And I said, totally, you know, like, I just want you to know I, I respect you. I think you'll be great at this, but I'll, I'm, I'll be around, you know, I'm not going anywhere. Then in 2020, everything kind of came together. There was, at the time, a big need at Liquid. They just finished ninth, and it just made sense. Having been in sports for so long, I've studied coaches, I've worked with coaches, I've been around coaches. Those were things that we would sit around and talk about. Like a favorite of his was uh, Phil Jackson, and he knew what Phil Jackson was doing. And I, I love John Wooden, and so we would talk about different coaching philosophies. And I, I very much inspired by his growth mindset and the way he goes at problems and the way he directs his energies. I think it's important to have a positive relationship with your coach. Otherwise, you'll just be stuck on a lot of arguments. Um, you won't get anywhere. Team environment might be worse. There might be a lot more tension. I feel it feels like he understands what I'm saying all the time. It's like nice to talk to him because he gives me like an objective view. And like other stuff, he like lets me like talk to him about anything, and like, he helps me understand or like. I guess validate how I feel and stuff like that. There is a little bit of excitement in terms of being able to teach young players, but I also need to approach it with just a massive amount of respect because I think back to when I was an arrogant little 19-year-old gamer kid, I definitely would not be very receptive to someone who comes up to you and says, let me show you the way about how you can be a professional, sir. Like, it just doesn't work. So I try and be what I think I would have wanted back then, which is a little bit of guidance here or there, but also making sure you can take a step back and let them explore their own space and let them make their own good decisions, make some of their own bad decisions, but I really want to keep them on track. So finding that balance is, is the test. The thing about Jat that just really stands out to me is that he's always been willing to try something new. He's off to do something else. I'm quitting casting, I'm going on the analyst desk full time, or I'm quitting casting altogether and I'm going to the gameplay team, or even I'm, I'm leaving the broadcast and I'm going to Team Liquid. And in all of those, like there's a natural curiosity in his mind and the way he solves problems. He doesn't rest, he doesn't get complacent. How can something be refined and perfected is the way that his mind usually trends. And I think that that's one of the, the qualities that you know really set him apart. I actually didn't have too many reservations. I wasn't worried because he had such a 
wealth of knowledge and experience that had developed over time in his career, right? Like he understood professional sports and he had followed those ecosystems. He was a player and a good one. <laughs> he then became a caster and then he worked on all of the quantitative information on the back end and balance with Riot. Like got all the pieces to be a great coach. So for me, I, I wasn't worried at all. I knew he would be great. It's hard to say if my first split coaching was successful. I think there are some successful things that I am proud of, and then there are also some things that I'm really disappointed in. To come so far at Worlds, to just be three and three again, which is exactly the same result, that Team Liquid had achieved at the previous two World Championships. I'm, I'm proud that the team could recover to that point, but I'm really disappointed that we couldn't go farther. If I take my own advice though, I, I said when I first started as a coach is like, the goal every day is not necessarily to win every day, it's to improve. And if you can take something and know that you've improved in that way, then that's progress and that can keep you going forward. The goal for me is to get people to play with joy because we have a ton of talent. We will have a ton of expectations and those things can just crush a team. So my job and my goal is to take that pressure off, get us having fun, get us playing fast, get us playing well and keep us improving without worrying about this really, really ambitious goal. Josh, from the time he was about five or six years old, was just that young boy that just spoke his mind. He has an ability to project into the future and any and all problems that may be there. I would not be surprised if Josh brought Team Liquid a world championship because I have not seen him fail at anything.